Amen. Welcome, everyone, to the City Community Church. Before we release the little children, let's, um, let's look at a few things real quick. Tomorrow, we have our Good Friday service, which is here. As you notice, the people next door are having service over there. We were going to have it over there, but somehow, some way, they, the lines got crossed. And uh, normally, they, they hadn't had it, but they had decided to have it. With, but we weren't informed, so we were moving forward. But praise God. Um, we'll have a Good Friday service tomorrow. It begins at 7 p.m. Same thing, same time. Gather a little early. Get here. This is the only time of the year during Resurrection Sunday, during your Easter weekend, when we have, you know, basically four services from Sunday to Sunday. We have the, um, the Palm Sunday service. We have the uh, Monday Thursday, which is tonight service. And then we have Good Friday tomorrow. And then Sunday is Resurrection Sunday Easter service. Okay? It's a long week. It's a lot of studying, a lot of prayer, a lot of trying to stay focused, not screaming at the kids, telling the wife, no, I don't want to eat that tonight. No. No, I don't want to. I'm waiting for the chili. <clears throat> but this is where we are. This is where we find ourselves. We find ourselves at this time in our life, 2022, with wars going on around the world, rumors of war is going to start, economies collapsing, regimes and countries being overtaken, children still being uh, trafficked, and all these evils going on in the world. So let you know, nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. God isn't expecting for everything in the world to change, but God is expecting for you and I to change. Amen. We can't always fix everything on the outside, but what we need to do is work with God to fix everything on the inside. And that's why we view our walk with God one person at a time. That's why sometimes it's hard for me as a pastor to minister to three or four people in one week because I'm really, I'm looking at the one that's really wanting God to do something with God, you know? And so I, I'm really reaching out, reaching out, reaching out. And I have to pray and ask God, which direction you want me to go? How do you want me to do this? What do you want me to do? Because if you can reach that one person, that one person is in contact with their family and their friends. And so if, if the Lord could move through you to impact somebody, you may just be impacting a whole family. You know what I mean? You got to look at it that way. And that person may be the seed that God plants into that family to bring change for generations to come. Amen. So don't ever think you're just ministering to a wife or a husband or a son or a daughter or an uncle or an aunt or a neighbor. Think of it as you're ministering to someone who God could plant in the midst of all their other family and friends to cause a combustion of change and people to come to the Lord. Amen. So tomorrow is Good Friday service and we'll talk about what's so good about Good Friday, if that's the day Jesus was killed. What's so good about it? We'll talk about that. And then, of course, we have our potluck on Sunday, which is April 17th, Resurrection Sunday service, the day that changed everything. Amen? I mean, it changed everything. It doesn't matter what is, what has been, what will be. This day changed everything. There ain't no other day in the year that's like this day right here. This day changed everything. And if this day never happened, everything else would mean nothing. It'd be, life would be meaningless if this day didn't happen. Amen? So that's that. So stick with me before we release the children because we want to sing happy birthday to Erica. There she is. Is Erica, where you at, Erica? Raise your hand, Erica. Praise the Lord. If you'll join with me to sing happy birthday to Erica, we'd really appreciate that. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday. Day to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday. Oh, the microphone, Erica. Happy birthday to you, yeah. Woo. Hey, I just want to warn y'all. It, you know, when we sing happy birthday to somebody, there's a fee for that. For every letter, it's $20. So you better not have a long name, Esperanza. That's a lot of money. All right. So we say happy birthday, and I'm kidding about that. There's no fee. Let's, if you'll join me, my wife's birthday was on Monday. If you'll join me to sing happy birthday to my lovely wife, up the one in the front over here, the one just a little bit taller than me. Yes, this one right here. Raise your hand, honey, in case they don't know who you are. Oh, they trust me, they know who you are. 
Let's sing happy birthday to my wife on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Renee. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. She paid for that. Trust me, she paid for that. I love you, honey. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do for the kingdom of God and for me and for the children and for all of our family and all of our friends. God bless you. I love you. And uh, since you're bringing the word, go ahead and come up tonight. No, I'm kidding. So let's, before we release the kids, let's just continue and just say that, uh, don't forget, we do have our YouTube channel. It's under Twin City Community Church TX, okay? And we also have our Facebook page, which we've had for a year now, Twin City Community Church. That's on Facebook. You can go on there, and most of what you see on YouTube uh, will be on this page, but also sometimes we put extra announcements and stuff on that page for Twin City Community Church, okay? Amen? Y'all good? All right, so on that note, we're going to begin our Maundy Thursday service, and we'll release the little children right now, whoever's taking them. If y'all can just wait for whoever your teacher is right here by the window, and we'll go from there. Amen? Praise God. If you're an adult and you want to stay back there in the back in the chairs, tables where you're at, feel more than welcome. If you want to move because it's too cold, feel more than welcome. Amen? Feel more than, you're more than welcome to do so. Amen? God bless you. Hello to everybody. And once again, I just want to welcome everybody who's joining us, either on YouTube or on Facebook. I don't know which one we're on. They never tell me. But uh, thank you. I do want to say, real quick, while the kids are moving around, I do want to say, uh, can I get your attention real quick? If, I, if you could do me a favor and help me uh, to, to say thank you to, to Sonia and her husband, Jason, for buying this new mic for our church. Amen. Let's tell them thank you for that. Amen. Amen. They didn't want me to say anything, but you know what? Praise God, because there's a lot of little other things that we need, and people are always asking, you know, can I give to that? Can I give to this? So we really needed this mic. As you can see, we don't have that other mic right here, right? Just cut it out. Took it out. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. So praise God. Now it'll be more efficient. Now, And we got a good deal on it. It was almost, you know, half price. So praise God. We saved several hundred dollars. Amen. Amen. Monday, Thursday service. People ask, what is Monday, Thursday? What does it mean, Monday, Thursday? Now, you know this is the Holy Week, okay? And because this is the Holy Week, the Holy Week began coming out of Sunday, which was Palm Sunday, okay? Then you had Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, and then you had Spy Wednesday. And now we're on Monday, Thursday. Tomorrow will be Good Friday. Saturday is a part of the Holy Week. Jesus is in the grave still on Saturday. And then Sunday comes around and that's Resurrection Sunday. Just for those of you who don't know, I've talked about this before over a year ago. The word Easter is not in the Bible. Okay, just to let you know. It was added into the New King or into the King James Version you know, when they put the King James Version out there, okay? But that word Easter didn't even exist during the time. Everyone knew that when Jesus rose from the grave, it was called the Lord's Day. It was never called Easter ever until the 1500s, okay? Just to let you know. For some going to ask me, they're going to say, what's up with the word? They put it in there. And they had certain traditional celebrations that they wanted to, to add to it. And uh, that's how we came around with the kind of Easter we got. If you look it up, Google it, um, it'll tell you when they first started using the word Easter. And so I think that's important for you to know because the way Easter is being celebrated now, or let me not use the word Easter because I really don't like it, to be honest with you, because it's not biblical. The Lord's Day, Resurrection Sunday, the way they are treating Resurrection Sunday now is nowhere near the way it was treated for over 500 years. Not at all. But you know, as in time, people start to change things. You know what I mean? 
They add this, they add that and everything. And the more you add, it takes away from Jesus, you know? Like, Melanie and I were texting back with each other. And it's Erica's birthday, right? And I asked her, when do you want me to sing happy birthday for her? Because everybody messages me. You know who you are. You'll message me and say, it's my husband's birthday. Don't forget. Or it's so-and-so's birthday. Or it's my birthday. Whatever. You know, you can go sing happy birthday. So, right? So, she messaged me. And I said, well, what, you want me to do it on Sunday? And she was like, uh-uh. Let's do it tonight. And then she messaged me back. Why? Because she doesn't want her, us singing happy birthday to her daughter to take away from the glory and the shine of Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? Because it's about Jesus Christ being resurrected from the grave on that day. I understood what she meant. Absolutely. Santa Claus robs from Jesus' birth. What does Rudolph have to do with Jesus? You know what I mean? What? So many things rob from focusing on God himself. And that's the devil's plan. If he could get you to focus on everything else except the main thing, he's got it. He's got you. He's winning. You know what I mean? He's winning. And so let's look at a definition of what Mondi means. In the book of John, beginning in chapter 13, reading in verse 34 of the gospel of John. Verse 34, here's what we see. It says, a new commandment. Everybody say commandment. That's what Mondi means. Mondi means a new commandment. Jesus commanded them to do something. It says, a new commandment I give to you. Because remember in the Old Testament, we had all the old commandments, right? But now Jesus is giving a new commandment. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus said many times, and we'll, we'll see it again in the scriptures. Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? Obey me. That's what he said. Jesus' new command is to not only for us to love one another, but to love him. To love him more than we love one another. Because if you love God more than you love one another, then you'll love all your friends, your family. You'll love them a lot. Okay? And so tonight... I want to focus on that night where Jesus was with them and gave them this new command. Now, I'm not going to focus on that new command. We talk about loving God and fellowshipping with God all the time. What I want to focus on is something just a little bit different. But I want to read this passage first, and then I want to take your eyes on something that was happening in the background, even though Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross the next day. So this is Thursday, the day before Jesus gets crucified on Friday tomorrow, okay? In Luke chapter 22, let's begin in verse 1. Luke 22, beginning at verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and I'll explain all of this to you in a little bit. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. And Satan, it says, entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray Jesus to them apart from the crowd. He's working it, isn't he? He's planning it out. He's trying to figure out a way to betray Jesus, who is God. He's trying to betray him. He's trying to, I mean, he's going to go to bed and wake up and think day and night how to betray Jesus. You know, when I was an addict, I was thinking day and night how I can get more money to get high again. You know what I mean? That's how much it was on his mind. But why is he doing it? He's not really doing it because he hates Jesus. He's doing it because he loves something else more than Jesus. And that's why when you're struggling in your marriage or in a relationship, it's not that you hate the other person. It's just that you're loving the other thing that's destroying your marriage more than you love your marriage. That's why the spouses have to be patient before they respond real hard towards one another. You got to find out what's the main reason, what's the main thing here. And look what we see in verse 7. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, 
When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as Jesus had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Verse 14. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, this is real important here. Very, very important. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant. Everybody say new covenant. It's the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the son of man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to discuss among themselves, which it says one of them, it might be who was going to do this thing. I read past it a little bit because I wanted to finish that thought. Today, I want to talk to you on Monday, Thursday, about the day the deceiver was deceived. This is the day the deceiver was deceived. Who's the deceiver? Satan is. But this is the day he was deceived. And if you don't understand that the devil has been deceived, you will continue to allow him to deceive you over and over and over again. Why? Because you do not understand what happened to him during this week. Now, pay close attention. The day the deceiver was deceived. Judas, many people say, was innocent. They said, well, he was one of the 12. I mean, why did God use him to do that? But Judas was not innocent. You know, sometimes you look at your kids, they make a mistake, and the other brothers and sisters are saying, Mom, why do you let them do that? Why do you let them get away? I, he's, you know, and they make all these excuses for the other brother or sister. You know what I mean? The kids ain't innocent. Ain't no person in here innocent, not even me. We ain't innocent. We are not innocent. But there are differences between people. You got people who ain't innocent, but do what God wants them to do. And you have people who are not innocent, who do what God doesn't want them to do. You know what I mean? There's a difference. Because no one is innocent, only Jesus was perfect, okay? But we can't use that as an excuse. And I'm going to show you why. In John chapter 12, verse 1 through 6, for people who say, why did Jesus or why did God allow Judas to do this? In John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, it says, Jesus... Therefore, six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with Jesus. This is the one who Jesus, he died, it was Jesus' friend, Jesus brought him back to life. Now he's there eating with Jesus at the table, okay? Verse 3, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, and pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Verse four. But Judas, everybody say Judas. But Judas is out. One of the disciples who was intending to betray Jesus said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. You see that? Why was he angry that she poured the perfume on Jesus? He wasn't really concerned about the poor. He was wanting there to be more money in the bag. Why? Because he kept taking money out. And as long as there's more, they'll never notice that he's taking money out. What was Judas? Not a concerned man of the poor. He was a thief. 
he was in love with what? Money. He loved money more than he loved Jesus. He loved to have what he wanted to have because money isn't the main thing he wanted. He wanted what money could get him. You got it? And that was his problem. He was not innocent. This is interesting, and I'll try to expound on this a little bit more, teach a little deeper on this. But let's look at Luke 7, 37. In Luke chapter 7, verse 37, here's what we see. It says, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. I wanted to read that to you because I want you to know who this woman Mary was. She was a woman that was looked at by everybody as the worst of the worst women. She was a prostitute. She had been in the community. She had been with this man and that man and all kinds of men, right? And this lady, for whatever reason, something in her made her want to come to Jesus Christ. Here's someone who's living horribly and knows she needs Jesus Christ. And you got Judas who's with Jesus every day and doesn't want him. How long can someone walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and keep living in a way that is blatantly sinful and displeasing to God? I want you to just think about that for one second. How long can someone keep coming to church and then disappearing and then coming to church and then disappearing and then coming to church and then disappearing? How long can they do that if indeed they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Think about this. Judas was with Jesus every day for three years, just about every day. But Judas was only with Jesus because being around Jesus helped him to get what it was he wanted. And it wasn't Jesus. But he wanted what came to Jesus because of who Jesus was. People gave money. People gave food and things to Jesus. And Judas always wanted to be around Jesus because Jesus had everything Judas wanted. People will come to church because they don't really want God, but they want what God can give them. And then when they leave and they run out of the blessings that God has given them through us, most of the time God blesses people through you and me because we're his children and we serve God. And they'll come around and be our Christian supposed brother and sister all the time around us. Then they disappear. What? is going on because they're only coming around because they're wanting what they need because of what they want to get through us and from us because they don't have the same favor and blessings that we got. So they come and get it, then they go back into the world. And once they run out of it, then they'll come back again because they want to put their hand in the bag like Judas is doing. You listening? Oh my goodness, God helped my marriage. Now it's been four months. It's, it's falling apart again. God, I need you. You're coming back to the bag again. But if you were with God, it would stay blessed. You got it? You know anybody like that? I see him a lot as a pastor. It's very concerning to me. I, I mean, I, it's really hard on me because I, I, I naturally, because of Jesus Christ in me, love people with everything that I am. I don't love people a little bit and examine them and always not getting close. When you come and you sincerely, and in the beginning, I see that you really want God. And man, I want you to be my brother and my sister. I give you all of me. If you need my car, I give it to you. Money, whatever, my time, whatever it is. If you need help with your husband, your wife, your children, your neighbor, your uncle, your cousins, your family member passes away. You need me. I give you me because God gave me himself. And people will take advantage of you like Judas was doing to Jesus himself. How long can someone go, though? The Bible says they'll be with us and then they disappear, aren't with us no more. Why? Because we catch on and we're like, we just can't keep giving you stuff all the time. Something's happening that you're not, you know, being able to get right with God and God work things out with you. What is it? And right when we're trying to figure it out and bring them to a place where they can repent and get right with God so God can fix it, they feel uncomfortable with us trying to fix it, then they leave again. They never get to the root of the problem and true repentance never happens. You know what I mean? Judas was a lover of everything other 
than a true lover of Jesus Christ. John 14, 15 said, Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? Obey me. What was Judas doing? Jesus had been preaching for a long time. Jesus said several times, if you are a taker, take no more. If you have wronged somebody financially, return everything you took from them. And Judas was disobeying what Jesus kept preaching for three years. What was he doing? Taking more and more and more. Joel Osteen has a car that's worth $9 million. He's serving God so he can serve himself. You got it? No reason a preacher ought to have a house worth more than $150,000, $200,000. What do you need a $25 million house for when you got people all around you who you could be helping out get out of the holes and the ruts in life that they're in? Why? Because like Judas... They're taken out of the blessings of Jesus for them. They don't know that Jesus said he gives it to us in order to give it out. You don't get it and keep it. If God gave it to you once, look, if if God gave me a million dollars once, he's going to keep giving it to me if I keep doing with it what he wants me to do with it. You're never going to run out. Why do you need to hoard 25, 50 million as if you're never going to get it again? Are you a fool? No, you're like Judas. You don't belong to God. You're around him. You participate in the things that look like God. But just because you're like Judas around Jesus all the time doesn't mean you're a part of Jesus. You got it? Luke chapter 10, verse 1 through 9. In verse 1, now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, Look what he did. Jesus took, he had his 12 disciples, plus he had another what? 58 more. He had 70. And he told them, I'm going to send you out in pairs of two. You two, y'all go that way. You two, go that way. And in verse two, he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return back to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in Heal those in it, in that house who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Didn't mean they were saved yet. Meant God was blessing them. You got it? Next verse, 12. I say to you, it will be more tolerable that day for Sodom than for that city. Go to verse 17. The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that listen to this closely. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. In what? That I've given you power to cast out demons. That I gave you favor with people to feed you when you have no money with you. That I gave you favor where people will let you live with them and stay with them because I'm putting it in their heart to do it for you. Has nothing to do with you. Has everything to do with me. And look what he says to them in verse 20. Nevertheless, don't rejoice that I'm giving you all this favor and power. He says, Don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is recorded in heaven. You know who one of them was that was going out, casting out demons and healing the sick? Judas. Did it mean that Judas was saved? No. It meant that God couldn't use Judas just like he uses the sun to give light and he uses the dirt to grow a plant. He could use anybody any way he wants to, but he won't use you to destroy you if you're a person who wants him. But if you don't want him, he can use you to do wrong. You got it? You're already wrong. This is unbelievable. And many people say, but God, Judas did so many things. 
Well, did he lose his salvation? No, he was never saved. God was just being good to him. So when Judas goes before God on judgment day, Judas is without excuse. God's going to say, man, I even let you have my power. When you laid hands on people, they were well. When you went into a city, you cast demons out. Did you ever have to work to feed yourself? You were out there for four and a half months preaching for me and you never had to work. Your work was serving me and I made sure that people took care of you because they knew me. You got it? had nothing to do with Judas. It was all about the plan of God. Interesting, in Exodus 32, verse 30, Exodus 32, verse 30, beginning in verse 30 of Exodus 32, it says, On the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a God of gold for themselves. But now, he says, but now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book, which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, don't be excited because of all the blessings I give you. You ought to hope that your name is written in the book of life. God will use you sometimes to do some things for him. Doesn't mean you and him are right. It means that he's good and he's merciful and he's given you a chance to fall in love with him. But you could still walk away. You can still walk away. How do you know when someone really is with him? You become an overcomer. Remember that series we went through on Sundays? What is an overcomer? An overcomer is someone who lives for the Lord beyond the normal. You don't say you're a Christian and still live normal. You're a Christian and you don't even want to live in the world. Matter of fact, sometimes you don't even want to go out these doors because this is where it's safe. This is where Christ is talked about all the time. You know, you're like, who wants to be out there? Some of you don't even want to go to work. You know what I mean? Just want to love Jesus in bed all day, stupid alarm. But look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 23. In verse 21 and 23 of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is speaking to these men. This is a real instant, a real situation. In verse 21, Jesus says to that group, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. You see, a lot of people think because of the good things they do, that qualifies them to get into heaven. But it's the internal personal life you have with God that determines whether you get into heaven. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Then you'll live for Jesus Christ. If you don't, Live for Jesus Christ, then you really don't believe in Jesus Christ. You got it? And look what Jesus says. Verse 22. Many will say to me, even Judas, on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy and preach in your name? And in your name, didn't we cast out demons? And in your name, didn't we do a lot of miracles? And then Jesus said, I will say to you, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness and evil. You got that? Y'all listening? Do you know many preachers you see on TV? Some of you might have favorite preachers that you think are going to God, serving God, going to go to heaven. But are they in it for themselves or are they in it for the people? We serve here at Twin City Community Church for you. We ain't in it for us. That's why for a long time, I'm just, I'm in my own little world not wanting anything from anybody. Just wanting to give. You know what I mean? Last thing we want in my household, in my family, someone to say, oh, you, you, you take this from the church or, or you get this from it. We don't get nothing. Why? Every now and then if someone gives us something, someone blesses us with something, praise God. That God put it on their heart. But to stand there when people give and my wife be waiting for us to get something after everyone's given, we don't ever do that and have never done that. And don't expect anything from the church. God's going to provide. I do daydream, though. What would I do if I had Joel Osteen money? 
I'll tell you what I would do. Every one of you would own your own house, have your own car, and have money in the bank for your children to go to school if they want to go to school. And then we'd help your next friends and neighbors who are ready to seek the Lord with that money. If God gave us 20 million, he'll give it to us again. Right? Well, y'all would love this church. I love this church. Y'all be here at five in the morning sweeping. I'm like, girl, go home. Uh uh-uh. uh. I got a light bill coming up, brother. I ain't. There are Old Testament prophecies of Jesus, I mean of Judas, about what kind of person he was. Basically, before Judas was even born, God spoke through men of what Judas was going to do before he was born. Let's look. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 and 13. Zechariah 11, verse 12 and 13. Here's what we see. It says, I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages. But if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. In verse 13, then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued. By them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. That's what Judas did. He he took 30 pieces of silver, then he felt guilty. Ooh, when I tell you reason why in a minute, it's gonna it'll change the way you thought about Judas. You remember when Judas was given the 30 pieces of silver in the movie? You watch it, right? What did he do? They're like, oh, his heart broke. He felt conviction. He felt guilty. He took the money and he threw it. And what was your thought? Your thought was, did he repent? Did he feel guilty about what he did? And then he went to go cry because of the horrible thing he did? I bet you that's what you thought. I almost guarantee that's what you thought. But let me tell you what Judas figured out it finally hit him Judas stole Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and when he finally realized the stakes were high and it was really going to go down the way the priest said it was going to go down they were really going to get him and kill him Judas got sad because 30 pieces of silver wasn't nothing compared to what he would have had if Jesus stayed alive He was going to throw up because his his pot of gold was about to get killed. And once he's gone, there ain't no money bag to put your hand in no more, baby. And he went and hung himself. If he was remorseful, he would have ran to Jesus Christ like Peter did and repented. And he would have been forgiven. But you never saw it that way before, did you? There are people who will do that to you and do it to me. They'll say they're Christians and they'll say they love you. I want to work things out. I want to get right with God. And then after they see they can't get nothing from you, they'll do what they can to destroy you. But then when they realize that they've done so much harm, you're about to leave them, they freak out because they went too far. You know what I mean? They went too far. And it's not until it's too late that they realized what they're about to lose. Got it? In Matthew 26, 15, Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. In verse 15, it says, let me start on 14. Then one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. You got that? What are you willing to give me? He wasn't thinking it was really going to go down. But you know what? When they saw, when he saw that they arrested Jesus and they started beating Jesus, he was like, whoa, they're going too far now. And he started freaking out. Are they going to stop? Are they really going to go through with this? Are they going to really get him crucified? He started freaking out because he was thinking he would get Jesus arrested. And in a little, maybe a week, two weeks, Jesus would get released or something. And he could go back and, hey, I did my part. I got him to you. It wasn't my fault you didn't go all the way with it. You know, he got his money and he still got the bag. Because he's thinking to himself that Jesus was never going to find out who it was. But Jesus always knew who it was. Just like Jesus knows who in here really is of him and who isn't. My prayer is that every one of you are his. Because just like Judas, before he was born, God knew he was never going to want him. 
My fear is that there are people who come to Twin City Community Church who God knew before you were born that you were never really going to want him either. And there are people who come in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. They do good, then they're gone again. They do good, and they're gone again. And in my mind, I'm thinking this could be a Judas. This could be. This could be someone who comes and it disappears, comes, disappears. We've got to be careful now. We've got to make sure they're not coming to try to get a woman out of the church, take her back into the world, or a woman get a man out of the church, take him back into the world, or always coming and always wanting help or wanting something. What's going on with this person? We need to know who is this person. What's going on? The Bible teaches us you'll know them. You'll know them by their lifestyle and the fruit they produce. When he's speaking of their lifestyle and fruit, he's not saying that out at work people say good things about you or amongst your family and friends who don't go to church with you say good things about you. What he's saying, the fruit that he's talking about, as Jesus mentions all the time, serving him in his kingdom. This church represents his kingdom. If this kingdom isn't satisfying to anyone, they need to go to a church where they feel satisfied to serve God's kingdom because the church is God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. You don't see the fruit happening. They just, people just come and then go. They don't ever, no fruit coming out of them. Never. You got to wonder, what's going on here? You know? In Luke 22, verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6. They were glad. This is the Pharisees and the high priest. They were glad and agreed to give Judas money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray Jesus to them apart from the crowd. What is he doing? He's planning and scheming. Planning and scheming. Some people will plan and scheme until they get a a blessing from God or they meet a brother and sister in church who God works through. And they're looking for a job or something and God uses the brother or sister at church. To get them a job, and once they get that job, they scheme. They got what they wanted, and boom, they leave God again. You got it? Are y'all listening to me, man? Y'all like, hello, hello, hello. Everything I'm telling you is the way you need to live your life and think out there in the world. Is my cousin really just using me, or does she? Am I supposed to be ministering to her? And she's supposed to be coming to the Lord. But why is it I've been ministering to her for two years and she doesn't seem to ever want to come to church or anything? Because she's getting the blessings out of the money bag, the blessing bag God has in your life, taking advantage of you. Y'all listening? This is some serious stuff. And everything that you have is not for people like that. It's for the people who really need it. You know what I mean? The Bible tells us when we're blessed to bless those who want God first. Because they want God, but the devil's trying to keep them away from God through the pressures of bills and bad choices they made in the past. And God wants to use us to help relieve them of all that pressure. And hopefully, once we help relieve them of that pressure, they'll have enough room to breathe and get right with God and boom, come out with a victory. You know what I mean? Get back on their feet and get going again with the Lord. Then they can help someone else get out of it. You know what I mean? Exodus 21, 32. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 32, here's what we see. In verse 32, it says, If the ox gores the male or female slave, the owner shall give his or her master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. This is the prophecy of 30 pieces of silver. Let me make it sense. Let me help you to make sense about this. In Isaiah 53, 5, I got to use a couple of scriptures to make this make sense. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, here's what we see. In verse 5, it says, but he, that's Jesus, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. This is saying that Jesus was beaten, beaten bad. He was pummeled, pummeled bad. And what this is saying is in the prophecy before that we saw in Exodus, it's talking about a man having a slave who got hurt by an ox. And in the law that God gave to the Israelites, if Your ox harmed someone else's slave. You owed them 30 pieces of silver. Right? 
God is calling the Israelite priests and the Jews, he's calling them an ox. They're the ox. What did they do? Let's look at what they did. One more time. You saw in Zechariah 11, 12, and 13 what we just saw about Judas getting the pieces of silver. Look at Luke 10, 16. It'll be real clear. Luke 10, 16. In verse 16, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. In John chapter 13, 1 through 17, Jesus is saying, and he's going to say to us, and as he told the disciples, you'll see in a minute, he tells them, I'm not your master. I am your slave. I'm here to serve you. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve you. And what Judas did, Judas acted like Jesus was his servant. And since the ox were the Jews, the Jews took Jesus and scourged him and beat him. And what did he charge them for what they were going to do to Jesus? They weren't supposed to kill him. They were only supposed to beat him. And how much did he ask for? 30 pieces of silver. See that? John 13, verse 1. Does it make sense to y'all? Beginning at verse 1. Now they're sitting in the upper room. They're having the Lord's Supper like we have it. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, he got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what, do, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not only wash my feet, but wash my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Even though Judas was with Jesus every day, he wasn't clean. Why? Because Jesus told the other disciples, y'all are clean. Why? They were clean because they believed who Jesus was. And they loved him for who he was. Were they perfect? No. But they knew that he was who he said he was so much that when they did make a mistake, they came back to him to repent. You hear what I'm saying? Judas didn't do that. But look at verse 12. So when Jesus had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me master and Lord. You're right. For so I am. If then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He just told them, don't get mad. I'm here to serve you. I was sent by my master to serve you. So how did Judas look at Jesus as his genie in a bottle? Jesus is here to serve me. You know how many Christians there are who come to church or pray or read a daily devotional because they want God to serve them? Because I'm being, look at me, I'm being good, God. I'm being good. You remember that thing I wanted and needed? And God says, you mean need? No, well, want, need, it's the same, right? People come to God because they only want him to serve them. Fix everything in my life. Open up every window you can. Remove people out of my life that I don't like. And God says, didn't I tell you to forgive even your enemies? You hear what I'm saying? It gets crazy. 
You can start seeing the person's mindset by the way they're acting. You know what I mean? In Matthew 27, verse 1 through 10. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Now when the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Why? Let him go, man. Let him wait. Wait a second. He didn't think Jesus was going to be condemned to death. He just thought Jesus was going to be beaten like an ox who tramples on your slave. But now he sees, you're really going to kill him? Oh, man, I'm, I'm losing my investment. Take this money back. Leave him alone. Leave him. Leave him. Got it? Verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned. That's a major word, condemned. He felt remorse and returned the 30 people the silver to the chief priests and elders saying I have sinned by betraying innocent blood but they said what is that to us see to that yourself and he threw the silver pieces into the temple sanctuary and departed and he went away and hanged himself the chief priest took the pieces of silver and said it is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it is the price of blood and they conferred together and with the money they bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers and they still talk about this field in the next couple of verses, that this is the field that was bought with that money. So that same money that Judas gave back, they used it to buy that land. You know how much money that was? That was a lot of money. And you know that that piece of land in Israel is still named the potter's field? Still there. You go wander around and go walk on it for miles and acres and acres and acres, and you just might walk over the same spot where Judas hung himself. We learn from the scriptures that Satan cannot take innocent people captive. Only those whose hearts are rebellious. Only those whose hearts are rebellious. Let's close tonight in the next 20 minutes or 15 minutes with these last couple of verses. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, here's what I want you to see. Beginning at verse 24 of 2 Timothy Chapter two, it says the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will all their life. You and I aren't born innocent. We are born with the desire to want to do wrong whenever the opportunity arises. Everyone born needs Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. You don't teach your babies to pull another baby's candy or pacifier out of the other baby's mouth. You know what I'm talking about? I was about three, and I, I think I was good at it. I'd take two passes. Satan cannot take anyone, and he doesn't take people who are innocent. Why? Because no one's what? No one's innocent. Until. But let's look at a couple more verses. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to walk according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. The devil can only work in people who are disobedient, not people who are Christians and disobedient, but people who are disobedient. What makes you disobedient? You don't want God because to want God means you got to live for God and be obedient to God. That's why most people don't come to church, because when you come now, you got to commit to God. That's why most people in the world aren't even married. They just shack up together today. Nowadays, today's day and age, there's a lack of commitment in the world. You don't find no one committing for nothing. Ooh, uh-uh. We don't even want to commit to a phone bill. We want AT&T. Ooh, I got to sign a contract. Mm -mm. I'm going to go back to cricket. <laughs> Nobody wants to commit. In verse 3, it says, Among them, we too all used to live 
that way in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Someone could be coming to church all the time and I've counseled some like this. And they tell me, man, I want to serve God. Man, I want to do this. Man, I want to do that. But then they go back into the world. Why? Because they still love the things of the world, just like Judas did. They're not really ready. If they were really ready, then they would be ready. You got what I'm saying? It's like someone saying, you want to marry me? Are we getting married or what? Well, baby girl, you know I love you, baby girl. You know we're going to do this. Just not right now. Just not right now. Why? Because he ain't ready to commit. He really don't love you. If he did, he'd marry you yesterday. You got it? You playing games with God. No, brother, we're just waiting. You know what I'm talking about? We just go wait. We're going to wait another two, three years. You're being disobedient to God. If you're a Christian, as soon as you find out that God says he doesn't like for you to be living with somebody and not married, boom, you would get married right away if you really love God. Why? Because the Bible said you will. Got it? <laughs> That's how you really know if someone genuinely loves God or not. Can't play games with people. Surely can't play games with the Bible. The Bible is so real, so true. The Bible helps us to spot people out. We don't judge. We examine. We're like, whoa, I, mm -mm. this girl over here with the banner praising God and everything. But she's she got this boyfriend she's living with that's seeing his cousin too. That, shh, take that banner away from her. She ain't doing nothing but moving the wind. You hear what I'm saying? Some people will do that on the outside to make you think they are on the outside, but inside they're dead like Judas. Judas was casting out demons. He was healing people who were sick. He was hanging with God himself, but yet his inside was dead. He was not of God. It takes wisdom to know who is and who isn't of God. And it's not that hard if you know the Bible. Some people say, brother, don't be judging me. Don't be I ain't judging you. I'm just telling you you ain't what you're acting like. That's all I'm saying. Don't be playing with me. Because you think you're playing with God. You act like God don't see. You're not arguing with me. Jesus told them, if anyone kicks you out and anyone argues with you about what I told you to tell them, they ain't arguing with you. They're arguing with me because you're only telling them what I told you to tell them. You got it? It's easy as that. That's why I don't feel ashamed. Oh, I'm going to tell you the right way. You're just too blunt. No, I'm too biblical is what the problem is. Right? That's what it is. You're just too biblical. God says don't, then don't. But Judas, he just couldn't. If you love God, you will obey God. Not because you can, but because he helps you. You got it? He helps you. Look, you want to get to Galveston? Right? You didn't get yourself to Galveston. The car you were in gets you to Galveston. You got what I'm saying? But you drive the car. You got this body, this life. When the Holy Spirit comes in you, you don't make all the right choices all the time, but the Holy Spirit in you leads you to make the right choice. Why? Because he reminds you why you should make the right choice because you're a child of God. Don't you love God? And once you feel that little conviction, you're right. You're, thank you, Holy Spirit. You know what? I'm, a, I'm not going to slap you today. Not today. I want to apologize to you and tell you I apologize for arguing. With, you know what I'm talking about? It doesn't always happen like that all the time because we're not what? Perfect. But if you do do something like that, if the Holy Spirit's in you, you'll feel sick right away. You're like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I just did that. You know what I'm saying? And if you ain't right with God, you're like, well, while they're down, let me do. Oh, my goodness. I thought, no conviction. No, you ain't right with God. <laughs> Look at James chapter one. We're almost there. Y'all are enjoying yourself too much. James chapter one. Verse 12 through 16. Verse 12 through 16 says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Judas was with Jesus for three years and was never approved. Why? Because Jesus knew his heart. God knew his heart. He was a thief. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He was always waiting for an opportunity to overcome for himself. Finding a way to, to, to gain for himself. You know what I'm talking about? God knows. God knows. It's crazy. It's crazy, but God knows. Look at verse 13. Let no one, that's me and you, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. 
for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Mm. You want to know why people sin and go back and do what they're, spo- and what they're not supposed to do? Look at this verse. Verse 14. When each one is tempted, when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Did God tempt Judas to take the money? No. He wanted money. Why? For whatever it was he was doing on the side. Who knows? He was putting a little stash in a Swiss bank somewhere. You know what I mean? Saving up for if Jesus ever decided to just stop doing what he was doing on this circus trip that he thought Jesus was on. If Jesus decides not to be Jesus no more, I got all this money to decide. You know what I mean? I mean, after all, he's got me walking around with him for three years. I mean, he's going to owe me. You know what I'm talking about? It says everyone's carried away by their own lust. It's not because everyone says, oh, the devil's out there. He's trying to get me. No, he's not. The devil can't, the Bible is clear. The devil can't be everywhere at the same time. He's not omnipresent. He's got demons everywhere, but he's not omnipresent. And the Bible just says right here, and let's keep reading it in verse 14. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then... When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Remember Judas was thinking about, planning about how to turn Jesus in? He was getting more pregnant as the weeks went by, planning it out. Ooh, when we go over there next time? Ooh, when we're alone and it's just me, Jesus, and the other disciples? Ooh, when it's nighttime and we go to the Garden of Gethsemane? Boy, he was, man, he was nine months pregnant with his plan. And finally, he was like, oh, I got him now. Let me go get that money. And he gave birth to what he was planning to do all along. By what? Telling him where Jesus was, and he got paid for it. He gave birth to that sin. That's like, you know, the guy who really doesn't love God or the woman doesn't love God. Payday's coming. Time to pay the bills. And what is the guy doing? Planning already on Tuesday how he's going to spend his money on Friday without paying the bills. I'm thinking it through. Woo! Thinking it through. I'm going to go to this store, buy this. I'm going to set myself up. Tell my homeboy, wait for me at this time. And uh, while he's there, I'm going to swing by and pick that up, come around this way, go get that other thing. I'm thinking it through. My wife will be there about 6 o'clock. As soon as my wife gets there at 6 o'clock, I'll have enough time, 10 minutes, to hide what I'm doing until she gets ready. I know she's already going to go with her aunt. By the time she goes with her aunt, I'm already going to take a shower. By the time I take a shower and she's gone, boom, I get into what I'm doing. Planned out all week. You know what I'm talking about? Then she comes back and I'm like, huh? I wasn't doing nothing. She got me. Don't tell my business, honey. It's private. You hear what I'm saying? That's the way it works, though, right? You're planning it out. You're planning it out. Verse 15 and 16. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do not be deceived. Let me skip this. I need to skip this. I want to take you over here real quick. The Old Testament and the New Testament are records of covenants between God and man. What's a covenant? A covenant is like a contract. It's like an agreement between two people. In the Old Testament, God made an agreement with them. If y'all live for me, I will deliver you from Pharaoh out of the hand of Egypt, and I'll bring you to a promised land. In the New Testament, Jesus is talking to them in the upper room. We take the Lord's Supper because there's a new covenant, a new promise, a new contract, a new agreement, okay? In the old covenant, what they would do is they'd take blood, and they would kill an animal, and they would take the blood, and they'd pour the blood all over the altar, and then they would take the blood and sprinkle it on themselves, okay? Because that meant instead of them, right, giving their life, They're saying by putting blood on the altar or the other person putting blood on him, if you made a contract with a person and you putting blood on you, what you're saying is that if I break this agreement, I'm 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 open to you killing me. You got it? This blood on me represents me gonna give my life to you if I don't do what you want me to do. In the New Testament, it's different. Okay? And let me try to explain this real quick because Jesus came to put an end to that old contract and give us a new contract, okay? Let's look at this clearly. In Exodus chapter 24, I think we got five minutes left. I think, I think, I don't know. I don't know. In Exodus chapter 24, I think it's better that you know this than not know this. Verse one, Jesus said, and then God said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. 
Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words, it says, recounted all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of all the people. And they said, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. Doesn't that sound like when you say you, I need God, bro. I need to change my life. Okay. Do you agree that you're going to give your life to God? That means you're going to live for God now. You ain't out there in the world no more, man. You agree? Okay. What's going to happen at that moment when the person wants to receive Christ or believe in God, have a relationship with God right there where they're sitting? Because we haven't been having altar calls because your heart is the altar. You got it? This is where you make that decision. And the blood needs to be sprinkled right here. This is the new altar. You got it? Now, let's keep reading it real quick. In verse 8, so Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant or the contract with the Lord has made is made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and the 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel and under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against them and the nobles of the sons of Israel. And they saw God and they ate and they drank. Look at verse 12. Now the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and remain there. And I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. This is real important, man. You got to let me finish this. Please let me finish this. This is so important. In the Old Testament, that was the agreement God made with them. God said, if you want to be in agreement with me, kill this animal. Take that blood and sprinkle it over the words that I, I told you. Will you live by this? I do. It's almost like a vow with the husband or wife. Will you do this? We will. Moses read it and everyone said, we will, we will, we will. And so he said, okay, you better keep your word because if you don't, God's going to remove his favor from your life. So he took the blood, sprinkled it on the words of God, right? The contract. And then he took it and sprinkled it on everyone who said they will. You got it? This is the same thing now. In the New Testament, in Ezekiel 36, man, let me take, let me just show you this in Ezekiel 36, beginning at verse 26. Remember what did God give Moses to sprinkle the blood on? He gave him two stone tablets, the commandments, right? The law that is God's agreement with you. Sprinkle the blood on that and sprinkle the blood on you. That means you and God now are in a contract together. If you need something, God, because he's able to give it to you, if you're not able to, he will give it to you. If God wants something, which is your worship and your praise, then you give to God what comes to God. Give him worship and give him praise. You got it? So if you worship and give God praise with all your heart, the way you're supposed to, whenever you pray, you will receive because you pray by faith. Faith in what? That God's going to keep his word to you because you're keeping your word to him. You got it? Now, in verse 26, it says, moreover, this is God making a promise. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you or make you walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. God's new contract goes like this. In the Old Testament, God wasn't in them. He was just around them. So they would make mistakes all the time. But God's saying, in order for me to get perfect praise, perfect worship, perfect obedience, then what I'm going to do is put my spirit in you if you agree to all of what I'm telling you of who my son is. You believe in him, that he's perfect and he's dying on your behalf? Yes, I do. Do you believe that he died and rose from the grave on the third day? Yes, I do. Okay, since you believe that, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to take his blood. Got it? And I'm going to sprinkle his blood on your heart. OK, and not only that, I'm going to put my spirit in you. So my spirit's going to be in you. You don't ever got to go to the mountain to talk to me right here. I'm right here inside of you. When you want to talk, just talk. I'm listening to everything. So God sprinkled his blood on the altar of the cross and he sprinkled his blood on us. 
When you believe in Jesus Christ, you're in a contract now with God. That's why when you pray, you ask God with confidence. You know he's going to come through. You're not, you shouldn't be asking, oh, I want this car. I want that house. I want that. You should be asking how God can help you be a blessing to everyone around you. God knows what you need. And as long as you're serving God, he'll make sure the needs you got are met. You got it? Why? Because he's in a contract with you. He will do his part if you do yours. Jeremiah 31, 31, don't worry about that. Let's finish with this one. I got to finish with this one. You got to hear this. First Peter, and this is the last one. I didn't say, I'm not going to say something else. I'm saying this is the last thing I'm going to read to you from the, the Bible, from the scripture. First Peter 1, verse 1 through 9. I'm trying to set the stage up for y'all. In first Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I may not even have to read it all to y'all. Listen to this. Those who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, meaning God knew if you were going to want him or not, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by, saint, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. When you believe in Jesus Christ in the spiritual realm, it's like God took his son's blood and sprinkled it on you. You're coming now in agreement with God into a contract together. That's why no weapon formed against you will prosper. That's why no matter what the devil comes to bring against you won't come to pass. If you're living for God and serving God and praising God and seeking God, if you're always struggling and your needs aren't getting met, you got to ask yourself, am I really giving to God everything I agreed to give him? Do I give him my time? Do I give him my service? Do I give him as much time as I give to my job? Am I giving my job 70 hours and only one hour at church to serve his kingdom? Them, what am I doing? And you'll be able to find out why it is you and God may be either distant or maybe there's a relationship where God and you are having a healthy one. And you could ask God and he'll come through for you. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is in keeping his part of the deal. If you're worshiping him with all your heart. Now, in the rest of this, in verse two, just look at that. God knew. By sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. To help you to obey Jesus Christ. How? He sanctified you with the Holy Spirit, putting the Holy Spirit in you. And he sprinkled you with the blood of Jesus Christ. Satan had one weapon and that weapon was the ability to accuse and condemn believers day and night. All these passages are about Satan accusing me and you. How does he do it? When you make a mistake, you feel like God doesn't love you no more. Oh, he doesn't love you anymore. You know what you're doing? What he's making you do? He's making you forget about that agreement. He's making you forget about the sprinkled blood on you. He's making you forget about Jesus dying on the cross. He's making you forget of God's goodness. That's what he's doing. But if you'll be like Peter, when you make a mistake, you will repent and come back to God. Or you'll be like Judas and feel guilty because you're losing something and you're going to be angry with God because you're not getting from God what you want. And it's not because you're not getting from God what you want because God ain't good. It's because you ain't right with God. And this is interesting because the devil, his main job is to deceive you. But let me just tell you something. When the devil used Judas to sell Jesus out for Jesus to be crucified, the devil thought Judas was his answer to the, all his problems. So he used Judas like in the future, he's looking for an antichrist to go to war against God. So he used Judas thinking since Judas was close, that Judas would help him destroy Jesus, the one who was, had, had all this power, all this ability to do what only God could do. So it backfired on him. So he deceived Jesus through Judas, but in the end, he deceived himself because he thought by killing Jesus, Jesus would stay down and he'd win the war. But by not knowing who Jesus really was, he made a mistake and he was deceived himself. So that's why it was the day the deceiver was deceived. When he sold Jesus out, he deceived himself. Oh, I'll get rid of Jesus. If I get rid of Jesus, I got the whole world to myself. What? Hey, man, what you doing back alive, baby? What happened? He was deceived. And you know what? He's trying to flip the script on everyone who belongs to God. And make you think you're deceived. God really doesn't love me. God won't keep his word to you. Jesus really didn't exist. There was really never no cross. He never rose from the grave. 
The deceiver who was deceived is still trying to deceive everyone else. Why? Because he's hoping you don't know the truth. And once you know the truth, what does it do? Sets what? Come on, say it. Sets you free. Free from what? Ever being deceived again. Amen? Let's pray. And then let's worship to a song real quick. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for on this Monday, Thursday, even for letting us go over, Lord. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you for how you strengthen us through the power of your word. The more we learn of how faithful you are, how good you are, Lord God, how willing you are to be there with us and for us through any situation and circumstance, we grow, Lord God, in our trust, in our confidence and love and for you and in our relationship with you. We ask that you would just open our eyes more and more on how we can be better sons and daughters, Lord God, to live for you, that we would now learn to do our part in this covenant, in this contract with you, Lord God, because you're always faithful and always know what we need, even before we know what we need, Lord. So we just want to thank you for always doing what it is, you're, what you do, what you promise to do for all those who love you, Lord God. But help us, Lord, to do our part in our relationship with you. If there's an area in our life where we're failing, where we're not doing what's right, don't let us turn out to be Judas's, Lord God. Turn our lives around. Strengthen us with your spirit, Lord God. Fill us with your word that we would know the truth, that we would be set free, Lord God, and able to serve you, not just with some of our heart, but with all of our heart. Help us to forgive others as you've forgiven us, Lord God. Help us to love the way you love and to give the way you give, Lord God, and to be be kind and considerate of others the way you are. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. This evening, we thank you. And we prepare ourselves for tomorrow to see why they call a day such as tomorrow, a day that was terrible, how we could call it Good Friday. Father, bless everything that we put our hands to do for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's... uh. Let's see if this will work. If you want to, let's see if I can get this to work. I don't know if it will, but I'll try. Let's worship the Lord. You can stand on your feet and you'll be dismissed. Praise God. I'm caught up in your prayer. I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this whole moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessing Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. I'm sorry. And I've just gone through the motions, I'm sorry. And I just sang another song, take me back to where we start. I open up my heart to you. Oh, I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot the you're enough, take me back to where we start. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your prayer. I just want to sit at your feet. I'm caught up in this whole moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here 
Supper this evening because the Lord took it with his disciples on this night. When the Lord Jesus Christ was with his disciples, he took the bread and he took the wine. And he took the bread and he blessed it and he told them, This bread represents my body. As often as you take of it, do this in remembrance of me. If you need one, you help yourself. Go ahead. Come on. We'll wait for him. Yes, sir. He was with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he broke it. We'll talk about all of that in the future. We'll explain everything. There's symbolism in everything. Know this. In the same way that Judas went after he did what he did and was used by the devil to deceive Jesus Christ, in the same way that he went and committed suicide, on that same day, Satan also committed suicide. He committed suicide against the power he had, against the ability he had, the deception power he had over everyone, if you would only learn the truth. That day when he sent Jesus to the cross, he deceived himself and committed spiritual suicide. He has no more power and authority over you. When Jesus blessed that bread and broke it, he said, do this. And as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Amen. In 
In the same way, Jesus with his disciples, he took of the wine and he blessed it. And he said to them, as often as you take and drink of this, do this in remembrance of me laying my life down for you. Remember, the key word there is as often. He blessed it, and then they drank it. Father, we thank you with no movement or anything. Father, we thank you. We renew the covenant vows that we've made to you, Lord God, and we gave our life to you. We thank you for giving us your life. Help us and lead us and guide us, Lord, to be who you've created us to be that we would do what you created us to do and that's to give you glory we give you all the honor all the praise in jesus christ's mighty name we pray amen and everyone says amen god bless you all say hello to somebody tell them god bless you glad you're here today it's a thirsty thursday night bible study everybody will be here on sunday i'm sure Thank you.